Have you listened? What's he told you? Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. We're going to continue this uh, series on the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to, I uh, just want to dive right into this verse. This ver it's one sentence and it's packed, man. It's packed. It's packed more than that bus you rode in on on the way to school. Packed. Packed. When it rained outside and there was nowhere to sit down on the bus. Packed. And the big sweaty kid sat next to you. Packed. <laughs> then you found out his name was Glenn. Packed. <laughs> that packed. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I want you to see the Trinity here. The grace of, that's the preposition, coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. So grace comes from Him. And the love of God, now that's the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Okay, so Jesus said amen in the New Testament 200 times. You might miss when Jesus has said amen because your, your Bibles will translate it as verily, verily, or truly, truly. Uh, amen not only means make it so, amen also means truth, truth. Okay? So it's not just truth, it's truth, truth. Right? So you just received, amen, verily, verily, truth, truth. Amen is, God, you said it. Amen means, God, I will do it. I will make it so. When you tell God amen, what you're saying is not putting a punctuation at the end of your prayer called a period. How do I end my prayer? Well, I need to tell God I'm done. He knows he knows when you're going to be done already. <laughs> Amen at the end of your prayer says, whatever is true in this prayer, I'm going to go do. It doesn't mean, Amen, now I'm going to do nothing and God, you're going to do something. Amen means, God, you're already doing something and now I'm going to join you. That's what Amen means. It means make it so because this is verily, verily true. What is true in this verse? Well, first of all, grace came from Jesus Christ. I want you to see that you are qualified for the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You are qualified for the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. You say, well, how am I qualified for that? I look at my own self in the mirror and I say, wow, you know, <laughs> I don't know about this. You are qualified because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came and paid the price so that you could have communion with the Holy Spirit. That qualifies you to have the Spirit. Now, we're going to learn today that not just part of the Spirit, you can have as much of the Spirit as you want. You can have all of the Holy Spirit you want. All of it you want. You're qualified. But not only that, it says, and the love of God. So the Father loved you and I so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price on the cross by the grace of God, providing qualification for each and every believer to have communion with the Holy Spirit. Communion with the Holy Spirit does not mean you're going to sit down every day, drink a little grape juice, and have a little wafer. Communion is intimate fellowship. It is an intimate relationship. It is as close or as intimate even more intimate than a man has with his wife that produces children. When you have true intimacy with your spouse in a marriage, there, is, there are results. They're called those little Indians running around your house tearing everything up. <laughs> intimacy produces this. Hello? Hello? You and I get frustrated because we're trying to work on character development. And here's what I want to teach you. If you would just learn to be intimate with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will be the result of intimacy. Things will birth into your life. Right. Things will be born into your life. Can I tell you that you were born again by nothing you did? You believed. 
And then God said, I love you so much, I'll give my son. He'll come and give the grace, pay the price, so that now you can have this intimacy with the Spirit. It, not just, it doesn't just produce fruit, which we would call character, but on the other side of the pulpit, okay, it produces charisma. Not the charisma you're thinking about. I'm not talking about the charisma of that old TV show, Chips. Where Ponch and John rode their motorcycles. Now, if you're under 40, I'm sorry. God bless you. I'm sorry. You missed this wonderful time in TV land. Where when there was a problem, they'd just get on their bikes, man. And pull out in the middle of the... They were the, they were the California Highway Patrol. They'd pull out in the middle of the street, stop six lanes of traffic, handle it. Charisma. We toss around this term charismatic. Charismatic means, it means gift, gifts. There are two trees I want you to imagine this morning in your mind's eye. One would be a fruit tree that because of its roots and its intimate connection with the soil naturally birth fruit because it remains you know, when Jesus taught about this, he said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Jesus never said, you're going to do it. He says, your job is all, only to remain. Yep. Stay connected to me. And fruit, character, will be the children. It'll be born. Same with gifts. In charismatic land, in gift land, Here's another tree. It's not a fruit tree. It's a Christmas tree. And underneath that tree are gifts. Gifts that the Holy Spirit gives you to open in your calling. Your calling is different than your character. But your character is just as important as your calling. And if you are seeking calling, but you're not seeking character, you're not going to have a fruitful ministry to people. You see, fruit feeds people, not gifts. You're not hearing me. Well, Brother Glenn, I just love it. I speak in tongues 30,000 times a day. You ain't feeding anybody. Fruit feeds people. Listen, my, my wife adores me as a preacher. She just does. We'll go home every day and she'll just say, I just, you're so gifted. You're laughing because you know that, 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 that. Something wrong here, Doc. Occasionally she'll say that's a good one. You know? What feeds my wife is character. Which is birthed from my connection to my communion with the Holy Spirit. My relationship with the Holy Spirit produces love in me. Which feeds my wife. Which feeds you. You're not fed by my gifting. My gifting, God may use to set you free or teach you or train you or raise you up, but it doesn't feed you. You see, we have too many pastors, come on, we have too many pastors that are gifted, but they don't have any character or fruit. Amen. They don't love their congregations. There's no joy, there's no peace. There's no long suffering. <laughs> there's no meekness. Fruit feeds. Gifting and calling ministers in a different way. It sets people free. It raises people up. But it doesn't feed people. Both of these, I will call today as we get into the... We're not even into the message yet. Both of these, I'm going to call legs. Legs. Some of you are hopping around on one leg. You have character... But you're not operating in your gifting. Or you're operating in your gifting, but you have no fruit in character. You're able to do things for the Lord that ministers to people, but then you don't go home and show the love or the peace or the joy to your own family. And God says, when you have communion with my spirit, you should have both. Because that's what it means, two legs, to walk. In the spirit. <laughs> no. Can we pray? Because I, 
I, it's like a download right now, and I just want to, okay, Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, we need you. We need your truth, God, today. We need your spirit today. We need your presence today, God. Lord, I, I'd love to see your power today, but more than your power, I want your presence, because your presence will bring your power. We're hungry for your presence. We want to have communion with the Holy Spirit today. In the name of Jesus, we pray and ask. Amen. Uh, communion with the Spirit is this intimate relationship that then produces. And it produces these fruit. It produces these gifts. Notice gifts is plural. Fruit is singular. All of the fruit of the Holy Spirit gets produced in you. If I try to do that, if I try to love, right, but I don't have peace, if I try to, watch this, watch this, if I try to be temperate, I'm going to be temperate today. Oh, I'm going to do it today. Oh, I lost my temper today. But I'm still going to be temperate today. What happened to love? What happened to peace? You see, I can only do one at a time. There's nine of them, Galatians 5. But the Spirit of God can produce them all. Can produce them. So fruit, singular. Gifts, plural. You don't get all the gifts. You get some of them. Some of them, the rest of you, you get others. And together we come together and we are the body of Christ. Did you know the Holy Spirit has a body? It's you. It's you. When you get to heaven, you're not going to see some flapping bird. Hey, welcome. I've been speaking. I've been speaking to you my entire life. Your entire life. Come on in. I mean, you know how scary that would be? 60-foot bird, man. He ain't big bird. That, that's not what he is. He has a body. The body is you. In, in the book of Corinthians, it tells us that. It says, know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You is plural. All of you. Temple is singular. Together, you are the body of the Holy Spirit. Woo! <laughs> and I, and I want to show you today that because of this communion you have with the Holy Spirit provided by the love of the Father and the grace of the Son, you can come as close to God as you want and you can have as much of His power to do what God is wanting to do in producing character and in gifts in your life. There's no limit. The only limit is you, yeah. me. The Bible says about Jesus, He had the Spirit of God without limit. Yeah. Let me ask you, are you in Christ? Then you were in Christ who has the Spirit of God. You have the Spirit of God without limit. The only limit is you. Uh, some of you I've gone out to breakfast with, lunch with. Some of you are really nice and you take me out to dinner. And you pay for it. God bless you. Keep it up. You good people, you. And I always wait for you to order first so I know how much I can order. And then the bill comes and it just passes around the table and then we know where it's going. You. No. I'm kidding. They set a craft at the table. If it's supper time, they'll set a pitcher at the table. What's in the craft and what's in the pitcher is more than what the cup can hold. You and I, we all the time, we say, oh God, give us more of the Spirit of God. Oh, give us more of the Spirit of God. And God says, I've already given you more than you can hold. If you'll just use what's already in, in the container and be poured out, I'll give more. There's already enough there. You already have all of the Spirit of God. The only limit to it is, is what you haven't poured out. You say, well, this church would really grow and it would get on its feet. Miracles would happen if we had more of the Spirit of God. No, it would happen if more people would be poured out. There's plenty of the Spirit of God. God always, <laughs> God always overfeeds. That's what I love about him, thank God. I love God. He's, he's always given more than enough. So, so, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about how to have communion with the Holy Spirit. How, how does this, what does this do in our life and how do we see it correctly, theologically from the Bible? How do we have correct theology? My Bible says in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood let me just stop right there because 
royal and priesthood is taking the kingly and the priesthood and putting them together. Those are two anointings. Peter says, you are doubly anointed already. For you are a chosen generation, right? A royal priesthood, doubly anointed in the oil. Come on. A peculiar people. Yes, you are. You're weird. So am I. Who should call forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? Well, what is Peter saying there? He's saying you're so anointed by God that God has set you up to be royal priesthood. He set you up to return back to the dominion that was given to Adam and Eve over creation. You're the head, not the tail. Act like it. Act like it. The head doesn't do what the tail does. I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get into that. And then he says, but you're also a priesthood. It, that's your ministry. So God is saying, I've given you an anointing. I just showed you the, the two. I showed you the Christmas tree and the fruit tree. I've doubly anointed you so that you can lead in my kingdom and so that you can feed in... Who wrote that down? So that you can feed in my kingdom and bless others. Out of your belly shall flow wells, plural, of living water. Not just a, not, go drink from the garden hose, kid. That was me in the 80s, growing up in the 70s. Yeah. It's like, oh, man, it's hot outside. Stay outside, drink from the garden hose, you know? <laughs> you don't know anything about that. Oh, yeah. My dad used to be in the kitchen. He'd be like, oh, it's so good you're out there. Stay out there. <laughs> garden hose is on. Get a drink. God's not a garden hose God. Try, try drinking from the fire hydrant. That's God, from the fire hose. And he's given you enough to both feed in character and also lead in gifting. Woo! Hallelujah. Now here's what happened to the church. Occasionally the church throughout history strikes oil. And then as soon as it strikes oil in the spirit, it moves away from there. It gets the blessing. <laughs> you see people do this. And God, pray for them, minister to them, love on them. But as soon as they get healed, they're done with God. You don't think that happens? How about the time Jesus healed 10 lepers? And he says, weren't there 10 healed? 10 didn't come back. Hello? You and I wrongly assume that they all went to heaven they got healed no they got healed and only how many came back come on church one came back a tenth a tithe came back oh the way is narrow so few people are really in it for the presence of god they want the power of god they just want the presence of god to get the presence of god you'll get the power of god thrown in it's like desserts free today but if you seek the power of God, not the presence of God, you may get one miracle in your life and then live the rest of your life straight to hell. Who am I talking to? Now, people will strike oil in a church and there'll be an anointing and there'll be a revival that will hit. And people will give their hearts back to God. They'll quit drugs. They'll quit drinking. They'll get right with their spouse. They'll start loving on their kids. They'll start disciplining your kids. I mean, that's revival. You know it's revival when... <laughs> <laughs> you mean you're actually going to tell your kid no yep god moved this is, <laughs> this is a brand new day in america <laughs> and as soon as things get fixed by the oil they move away from there there's a song that i want to tell you this morning that illustrates this oh you're going to miss the song come on let me tell you a story about a man named jed a poor mountaineer, he barely kept his family fed. Then one day, he was shooting at some food. Do you know this song, sir? God bless you, I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize. I, <laughs> I apologize. I then one day, he was shooting at some food. And up from the ground come... Black oil, that is. Texas tea. Well, the, fr 
The first thing you know, oh, Jed's a millionaire. The kid folks said, stop. That was, that's the problem. That's the problem. California ought to be the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they did what? Hills, that is. What? And move. Right? It's a it, greatest show on TV. But it tells us the truth about the church. A, truth, a church gets into the truth, they strike the spirit, and the spirit starts to flow into their life, and they start to get blessed by the flow, and then they make the biggest mistake a church or a pastor or a Christian could ever make, and it's this, they move away from the flow, and they, all, they, they go get sophisticated. I loved, Buddy Epson had that hat, and it was that old felt hat, big old brown it was in black and white, so you couldn't tell it was brown, but it was brown. And some of you are like, there was black and white TV? I don't remember that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, and there was two stations. Maybe three. <laughs> and, and, and he had this hat, and it had holes all in it and everything else. What I love is, is when they moved to the Beverly Hills, he never, he never changed. <laughs> and neither did, neither did Granny. She never changed any. And you know what made the show funny? It's they were peculiar people. Yeah. They kept something. But what happened to Jethro? Yeah. You, have you watched this show? Yeah. Jethro started living like the world. Uh -huh. You know? The devil was played by Mr. Drysdale in the show. Yeah. You don't remember him, the banker? Yeah. He'd show up. He'd say, well, you need to do this, and you need to do that. And then he had that little secretary. What's her name? Miss Hathaway. And she'd go, hoo, hoo, hoo. Right? And Jethro would always be up to something ridiculous. So would Ellie Mae. Right? So what happens in one generation is they experience something in the presence of God, and the next generation never experiences it. When, when, when the Holy Spirit moved in the upper room, Peter came out and preached a sermon, and what he said in that sermon was this, this promise is unto you, and unto your children, and unto your children's children, and as many that are far off that would call upon the name of the Lord. It's generational. But the reason why the next generation doesn't get the Holy Spirit like the former one does is we moved. We got all Hollywood. You go into the you go into the common church today and you don't even know what the presence of the Holy Spirit feels like anymore. Instead of evangelism, we have marketing. And, and, and instead of worship, we have an entertainment, come on, experience. The focus is not on Jesus Christ and on the presence of His Spirit. The focus is is on how great our band is. Nothing wrong with gifts, man. Gifts are cool. But we have no roots. People aren't fed by gifts, they're fed by fruit. And you know, you know what's that? What, 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 what do we call our services? What do we call our members in our services? They're consumers. They show up and they show up to a really, really dark room that's filled with fog and lights are going everywhere. And listen, you gotta, you gotta hold on here. I've seen everybody there is to see in concert, man. You're like, you're just an old fuddy-duddy. No, I'm not, man. I, man, I used, to, I used to play music. I used to do, I love, man, I love a cool light show, you know, cool music. But when I come and I wanna be in the presence of Jesus, I want the focus to be Jesus. Then I want to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I want to know intimately what that feels like. And that's gone. Are you listening to me? It's gone. And there are too many pastors that are afraid of you to tell you the truth about that. The truth is, what everybody's really hungry for is the presence of God. Amen. Come on, church, give them praise today. All right. 
Well, you know, we got to be like the world to reach the world. John 15, 19, you're not of this world. You know what people in the world would love to see? Something different. Something different, man. Something different. <laughs> we need the oil. We need to stay close to the oil. I want to show you three ways we need to do that. First off is this. First off is this. Stop seeing the Holy Spirit as an it. And start treating him as a person. He is a person. He's a person. He has feelings. The Bible says so. You can grieve him. You can quench him. You can hurt him. I don't get that. My brain isn't big enough to understand how the very part of God in creation, person of God in creation, comes and hovers over the face of the deep in the middle of darkness, and then there's light. His presence comes before any of the blessings. Yeah. Do, do, don't you remember what Jesus said? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said, tarry in Jerusalem. And then he said this. He said, power shall come upon you after the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. What comes first? The power? No, the presence. The presence of God would come first. And I can hinder that. I don't know how. But it's the way God said. I can, I can grieve that. I can quench that. I, I, I can mistreat that. I believe that originally in the garden, when Adam and Eve walked with God, they walked with the Holy Spirit. And you're saying, Pastor, this is weird. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, if it was Jesus, then it was, the Holy Spirit was there too. <laughs> but, but let me tell you why. When the Bible says that Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day, the cool of the day in Hebrew is ruah. Ruah, ruah does not mean cool of the day. I'll tell you in a minute what that cool of the day means. It help, it'll help us. But um, ruah, Elohim, means the Spirit of God. They walked every day with the Spirit of God. After Jesus dies, provides the grace, the love of God, the communion of the Spirit comes back to us. And Paul then says, walk in the Spirit of God, and you shall not fulfill the lusts or the desires of the flesh. It's all back to walking. Now, I want to show you something here. It does say cool of the day, but let me tell you about that part of the world and the cool of the day. The cool of the day comes just before the sunrise. It's not at the end of the day. Now, some of you work outside, some of you are farmers, some of you work on houses and buildings, you, you're in construction. You know the earlier you get out there and get started, the better it is, because it gets hot. The cool of the day is right there, in the, right there before the sun rises. Just like he did in creation, where he hovered over the face of the deep, and it was dark, and God said, let there be light. Here it comes. The Spirit of God comes in the cool of the day. In other words, he shows up and says, let's go on our walk together today. This is why it's so important when you wake up in the morning, please, 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 please commit to doing this. First thing, don't even get out of bed. Holy Spirit, good morning. What would you, what would you have in store for me today? I told study school class, I said that three, three four days ago. Woke up in the, in the bed, I said, all right, Holy Spirit. That was, that was a good rest. <laughs> what, what, what's on for today? And I immediately heard a word from the Lord. Bam. Will you obey me? Wow. I was like, this is kind of cool because I love hearing stuff. And I didn't hear it with my ears. I heard it in my heart. Okay. And then when he said, I, 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 gave, I gave him an unqualified yes. Then I got scared. What I sign up for? Yeah. What I sign up for? And lo and behold, about, about five hours later, something came up. And my wife says, now what are we going to do? I said, the Lord says that I'm to obey him. Well, honey, you've said no, no, no to this for a lot of time. I said, yeah, but this morning I said yes. Yeah. You, do you hear what I'm talking about? Yeah. And, and, and so... I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit in communion and I knew what I was to say yes to. And, and the cool of the day was right at the start of the day. Not get up and go, oh, I gotta go to work today. I'm gonna see that stinking boss. Man, he needs some deodorant, man. 
you know, and then I got to work with those people who don't even do their job. Thanks a lot, God, for this day. Wish my wife would wake up and make my lunch for me. Oh, she's got a job too. Oh, I know. <laughs> and you know, the devil's going to win that day. You, you just might as well just, you might as well just said, hey, <laughs> put a kick me sign on my back, devil. Just lay into me all day long. But you tell the Holy Spirit in the cool of the day. Now, where does the Holy Spirit go when I sin? Watch what happened in the garden. When they sinned, it wasn't the Holy Spirit that hid. It wasn't the Spirit of God that withdrew. The Spirit of God still showed up for the walk. And then he said, where are you guys? He knew. They didn't know. Well, we're hiding from you. Why do you need to hide from me for? What? Why? And then we're covering our private parts, <laughs> which is called religion. Like Church USA every day, a solid hour and a half of taking fig leaves and going. <laughs> to God, that's how it looks. He's like, that's ridiculous. Let me take care of that, would you? Quit running from me. Quit hiding from me. Quit playing games with yourself and me. Let me take care of that, would you? Let's go on our walk. It's the cool of the day. I'm here. I didn't run away because you sinned. I'm here because I love you. And I want to walk with you today. And the Bible says that God covered them. He made atonement and covered their shame. This is what God wants for you. Where does the Holy Spirit go when I sin? He's right there. Where do you go when you sin? That's who moved. He's not an it. He's a person. He's he's not going to run away from you. He's kind of tenacious. Well, not kind of. He really is. Um, Like for 35 years, he's like not left me alone at all. I wake up and he's like, hello, hi. I'm like, no, 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 come here. All day long. And I've learned to just give in. Hello. He's a person. He's a person. He's a person. And he wants communion with you. He can be disrespected like a person. You can ignore him. You can hinder him. Um, You can blaspheme him. That's saying no to him with your life. It's unforgivable to say no to him with your life. Also, move from power to person. Too, too, too many Christians, they want to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. That's just a given. It's the person of the Holy Spirit that gives you the power. And it blesses you. He is an individual person. He is powerful. But he first wants intimate relationship with you before he gives his power. Now, I'm going to talk about Sarah and I for a second. And don't get yourself all in a mess over this, Okay. But when I married Sarah, I had all of Sarah. She's nodding yes. I've been married for 35 years, right? Okay, all right, right? All right. So, at salvation, you got the Holy Spirit. There are people that have the Holy Spirit but they're not surrendered and submitted and, and growing in the Holy Spirit. They're not walking in the Holy Spirit. And if they are walking, they're limping on one leg. Yeah. Or maybe they're crawling. Or maybe they're lame. But when she came into my life, just because I had all of her doesn't mean I knew all of her. Intimacy had to be built over years and years and years. You know why old people, old, old married people, laugh at young people that are married? <laughs> go ask him <laughs> go ask him because they've worked through all that already they pretty much know forget about it it's not a big deal and you know what's great when you get older god helps you with that your hearing starts to go so you didn't hear it anyway you, you didn't hear it anyway and your sight starts to go so you didn't see him do it and you know all you're left with is love and I'm telling you, my wife, 
all the time. I just turned 53, I'm about 54, and my hearing's just a little bit because I've been to so many rock concerts, you know. But uh, my wife would say something now, and I'm like, I didn't hear a thing. Should I ask? Maybe not. So I'll go, huh? And then she'll tell me, and I'm like, why did I ask? I could have, you know. And, but, but, but she'll say thanks to me, and I'll miss it, and I'll ask, and then I'll be like, oh, I'm so glad I asked. And now I'm actually paying attention to her. This is what I'm really talking about. I'm joking, but this is what I'm really talking about. Now I'm conscious of her presence. She works, see, here's the thing. She actually works part-time for the church too, which means full-time. Okay, so like when I go into office, in the office and work most of the time, right around the door, there she is. Okay, and then all day long we go visit people, especially if it's female. She goes, we go together, okay, and there she is. And then we go home at night, and guess what? There she is. And like all day long, I can take it for granted because I see her all day. And I can take it for granted that she's in my life. And I can think that I really know who she is, but instead of treating her like a, <laughs> instead of treating her like a person, I just take for granted the power of her being in my life. Having no idea, watch this, that the Holy Spirit is actually the one that gave you the wisdom that now got you the raise, and you forgot to give God any praise for that at all because he's been in your life all along, gave you that word of knowledge, that word of wisdom, gave you that power to stand in the middle of a situation nobody else would. Now you've been promoted, and then you look and go, well, ain't I just a bag of chips? I'm the hottest thing since sunburn, and the reality is this. You have had a person walking everywhere you walked, making that stuff happen. And then you say, oh, give me more power, Lord. And the Lord says, you know what? As soon as you start to respect my presence. Amen. Even though I've been married 35 years, I learn all kinds of things. We're not as intimate as we need to be. I told her something last night. She goes, we're not doing that. That's not you. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I? I was like, honey, you can run your fingers through my hair all you want. You're like, we're not doing that. <laughs> I said, well, maybe I'll like it. I don't know. She's like, you've never liked that. And you barely got any hair, so what are we going to do? I'm like, no, let's try it. That happened. I'm not lying. Okay? You do a little... You're laughing, but you could grow in your intimacy too. Yeah. It saved me some counseling appointments in your life. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done talking about you with your marriage. Hey, figure it out. Do a little hair rubbing. <laughs> Gee whiz. Okay, treat him as a person, and he'll give you his power that you need, okay? Okay, and then lastly, then lastly, <laughs> walk with him. And that means we're going to finish where we started. Walk with him. That means use both the legs he gives you. When you were born, you were born with two legs. But you didn't walk. You had to learn how to walk. That's the problem. Most of you become a member of a church and you think you walk with God. You don't walk with God because you're a member. Just because you're a member of Costco don't mean that you're a box of items. It doesn't mean anything. Oh, I've been part of this church for 35 years. Yeah, and you haven't walked a step. You, you, you have to learn how to walk with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the word in, in the Greek is cadence. It, it's just in, in step, in timing. He leads. You walk with. And there's two legs. It's, uh, there's, there's charisma and calling. And, and there's also character and fruit, okay? And, and he wants to develop both of those in your life. And, and if you let him do it, it, it will be born, birthed into your life from you just walking with him. Now, I want you to re remember the guy at the gate beautiful. The lame man at the gate beautiful. This is where we'll end the story here, okay? The lame man at the gate beautiful. This guy was born with legs. This guy was born with legs, just like, just like you. You were born again with legs. But they wouldn't work. There was a communication problem between his, probably his brain, his spine, and his legs. He was born with legs that would not work. 
And John and Peter come along, right? And what is he doing? He's in front of the temple too. I want you to think about churches that are dry of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Dry. They have no oil. They've moved away from the presence of God. And listen, John and Peter are en route to worship. And they come past this guy. And why is he on the outside? Because there's no power on the... You've heard your grandma and grandpa talk about the miracles of God, but you've never seen the miracles of God because the church you go to just spent $300,000 on a sound system but can't take three minutes at an altar in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That hurt. <laughs> Got to be careful. He's outside. He needs the power of God. The power of God isn't inside the church. Peter and John show up. He's begging alms. I'm tired of believers. Believers who can't walk begging God. We're begging God. God, oh please, God, will you? God, will you please, God? God, will you do this, please? God, I don't see any of these promises in my life. I know you promised them, but maybe it's for Joe Schmo or Jojo the dog, uh, dog face boy, but not for me, God. Why, why do they get it? Why do they get it? But you don't do it for me. And you know what God says? I have done it for you. I have done it for you. Get to know my spirit. See, you want the power, but you don't want the person. Get to know the person, you get the power. So then what happens is, when you don't know how to walk, just like when you were a baby and you were born, when you don't know how to walk, people carry you, people help you up, people grab you by your sides, and they walk with you. You know who that is? That's spirit-filled, real spirit-filled Christians who know what it's like to walk in the spirit. And you want to just go, quit, I can do it. <laughs> quit, I, oh, I can do it. It ain't about you doing it. It's about the Spirit doing it. They've learned that. You haven't. You want to do self-reliance. You want to do sweat and stress. You want to do it on your own. And they can teach you how to trust the Spirit of God to do it in you. But you're begging God for something. You want God to bless you at work. You want a better paycheck. You want God to take away the bills. Oh, I know you do because I pray with you about these things. He's begging for alms. But what he really needs is to know the Holy Spirit and walk with him. And then Peter reaches down and says, silver and gold, have I none? <laughs> you see, we struck oil and we didn't move away. We still got the oil. We still got the spirit. Silver and gold, have I none? But such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Rise up and walk. Wake up, church. What did they have? He said, such as I have, I give to you. This is why we lay on hands. It's impartation. I don't have time to teach more on that. Maybe next week you come back. The laying on of hands is not some like super charismatic rolling in the aisles, swinging from the chandeliers thing. It's Old Testament and new. It's impartation. Yep. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives in me, and I impart it on you. Yep. It's how people were called to ministry. It's how people became kings. It's how people became prophets. It's how people became priests. They were anointed by the laying on of... Yes. You're like, you were in a don't-touch-me world, but God says, I'm all about love, and okay, such as I have, what did he have? He had the Spirit of God. Such as I have, I give unto thee. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And the man didn't just walk. The Bible says he started a leaping. <laughs> okay, white people. Especially white people that are 50 and above. I haven't leaped since I was 15. You just might. You just might. The Bible says he went running and leaping into where? Oh, he got out of the gate, sis. Into the sanctuary, into the tabernacle. And he disrupted the whole thing. Praise God for that. Yeah. 
we finally got church. Finally, we got the oil back. <laughs> so much so, it calls to stir. Whoo! <laughs> hey, awesome. The power of God is back. Do you see? It's like I was saying to the class this morning. I never tell anybody to quit smoking. I just say, get to know the Holy Spirit. I don't tell people to quit pornography. I don't have to. I just teach people to listen to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I don't tell people they got to be loving to their wife. Their wives do. But, you know, I... <laughs> but I no, I, I, I get to know the Holy Spirit. We have to tell people. Listen, when you hear his voice and you are in communion with him, he changes you from the inside out. Just like that church needed the spirit, but it was first changed in a man who couldn't walk. And now he's walking on both legs. He's walking in gifting and he's walking in fruit. And that's what the church in America needs today. That's what we need, church. Would you stand with me in prayer? As the worship team comes, we'll, uh, we'll make an altar right where we're at this morning. A place to meet with God. Please, just you and God today. You and God today. Let this be a holy moment. I want to remind you this morning that Jesus said to all those who would listen, He said, come, comma, follow, comma, I will make. I will make. If you're here today and there's something in your life, you know it has to change. You know you're crawling when you should be walking. You know you're just scooting around when you should be standing and walking in the Spirit. Let me tell you something. Jesus said, I will make. Just know His Spirit. Just be intimate with His Spirit. You are qualified by the grace and the love of God to be intimate with His Spirit.